if you're still using a for loop in your code, you're an amateur. I mean, why would you use that if you can just use map and filter and be a functional badass? It's much better, right? Right? Well, let's find out. In fact, I will show you four cases where using map or filter instead of a for loop actually makes things a whole lot worse. Let's dive in. Let's start with the obvious. You've seen this a million times. This is basically a for loop that combines filtering and mapping into one. So I have a class user, it's a type dictionary. I then create a list of users and then I iterate over that list using a for loop. And if the age is over 18, then I'm going to add an uppercase version of the name to that list of adult names. So that's very basic usage of a for loop. And when I run this example, then this is what I get as a result. Now, it's very nice. We can immediately see what is happening by simply taking a look at the code. It's pretty clear and readable, but it's also, you could say, kind of verbose. It's more an imperative way of programming how things happen, not what is happening. So let's rewrite this, but now use filter and map. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to get my adult users and this is going to be a list where a user is filtered by age. And similarly, what I will do for the adult names is then I can use map that actually uses the adult user list and then maps each name to an uppercase version of the name. And then I don't need to do this anymore. So I can simply remove that. And now when I run this same code, of course, we're going to end up with exactly the same result. But now I used filter and map to do the same thing. So this is a more declarative way we describe what we want. We want a filtered list where the age is equal to larger than 18. And here we want a mapping from this list of users to the uppercase names. Depending on specific logic, this can also be more compact and potentially more readable once you get used to it. Another thing that's nice about filter and map is that these things are lazy because they return iterates. So it can be more efficient. If you only need to uh, filter out part of the list, then this will allow you to do that. Whereas with the for loop, that's not really possible. Now, next to the for loop and the filter and map solution I just showed you, another option is to use a comprehension, which is a really nice Pythonic way to solve the same thing. So in that case, what you would do is we would have my adult names, and then I can use the list comprehension to achieve the same result. As you can see, it's an interesting combination of a sort of kind of a for loop with a conditional statement. Uh, and we put all of that into a list, so that's a comprehension, but it's also a really short, nice way to do this particular job. Under the hood, Python just executes this as a loop, but it's a bit more expressive and concise than the for loop that we had at the start. So those are kind of the options, right? We have the for loop, we have map and filter, and we have the list comprehension. Now, before I cover some issues with, in particular, map and filter, Let's just benchmark this example. I've expanded here slightly. I still have that same list of users, but now I just generate a huge list of users so that we can measure some performance differences. And then what I do is I have three versions of the code. I've already showed you these before. We have the for loop where we go through these users and only append the adult names. I have the map filter version of the same thing, and I have the list comprehension version of the same thing. And then I'm using perf counter from the time module to measure the start and the end time. So when I run this, then this is the result that we get. So as you can see, the for loop and the list comprehension are actually quite a bit faster than the map and filter solution. Now, maybe you get different results if you try different types of operations. And of course, if performance is really important to you, don't use Python, but it's still interesting to see the difference. Now, this difference honestly will rarely be critical unless you're, of course, processing millions and millions of elements. So the question is, if you don't care about performance and you'd like to write in a functional style, should we just replace all the for loops with map and filter? Well, definitely not. I want to cover four clear cases where trying to go functional with map and filter actually makes your codes worse and potentially even buggy. 
The first case is complex logic. So if your logic includes nested conditionals, default values, multi-step processing, etc., map and filter can actually make it pretty unreadable. But here I have an example of a piece of code. So this is a function called transform that takes a collection of data, a list of data, and then does some work on it. So uh, as you can see, depending on if there is a flag in the item, it's gonna try and do something. So this is a relatively complex piece of code. Of course, if you take a look at it, you can figure out what is going on, but it's still kind of complicated. Now, that might also be a reason to actually split this up more, but for now, let's just keep this example as is. And in my main function, I then have a list of data, sample data, and then I transform that and print the result. So when I run this, like so, then this is what we get as a result. Now, like I said, even though this logic is kind of complicated, you might want to design it differently, it's still relatively readable with the for loop. But if you take a look at what the map version of this code looks like, then this is what you get. And actually, when you look at it, this is actually pretty hard to understand because we have these uh, Lambda functions here, uh, we have this sequence of get operations, there is an if statement here that's also kind of adds complication. So it is shorter than the version we previously had, but it's very hard to understand by looking at this code. And if you want to debug this while keeping the code kind of in place, it's going to be a nightmare, especially with these nested structures and implicit defaults. It's almost as bad as debugging regular expressions. And on top of that, the version that I have here actually introduced a bug. If you remove this B element from the data, actually this is going to crash because we're trying to access it here directly. Whereas in the original version of the code, we cache the key error and then we simply append minus one. So actually it didn't even precisely map the behavior because that's actually kind of hard to do with the map version of this code. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. And actually this argument also applies to list comprehension. So here I have a list comprehension version of that same code. Now it's even shorter and more compact than the map version that we have here, but it's just as hard to understand. It's not much better. Now, of course, like I said, this is a contrived example. Maybe you want to split up things more anyway into separate functions. And then again, it might make sense to use map. But as you can see, map, filter, and even list comprehensions can be hard to read. By the way, if you want to improve the way you structure and design code in general, I've got a free design guide that might help at iron.code slash design guide. Covers the seven steps I use when designing new software from scratch. The link is in the description. Now the second case I want to cover is exception handling. So like I mentioned, there's an issue with exceptions in the example that we just took a look at. Now you can solve this by splitting things up more and then using a separate function. But here's another example of where handling exceptions inside a map or a filter can lead to messy lambda logic and unclear failure paths. I have a parse numbers function here that gets a number of inputs, which are strings. And then for each of these strings, it's going to try to convert it into an integer. If that works, it adds it to the list of valid numbers, and then it returns that as a result. If it doesn't work, I want it to print that there was an invalid input. In my main function, I have a list of strings. So one of these is invalid, as you can see. I try to parse it, and then I'm going to print the valid numbers. When I run this, like so, then you can see that we get indeed that one of the inputs is being skipped because it's invalid, literally. How would you convert this into something more functional? Let's say we want to avoid this for loop. Well, in that case, what you might want to do is that's what you see here. I have another version where I have a safe convert function that's defined inside parse numbers, and that actually handles the exception. So we try to turn the value into an int in this function. So that's for a single value. If there's a value error, we print it, and then we return none. And then what I do here is that I'm using map and filter in order to create the list of valid numbers. So I'm mapping safe convert onto the user input. So it calls that function on every element in user input. And then with filter, I remove everything that is none. And then I turn that into list and return that as a result. That's how you would do it with map and filter. But 
Now, suddenly what we're doing is we're returning none to indicate failure and then trying to filter it out later. It makes it much harder to follow the flow and debugging kind of gets awkward. So this clever functional code actually does more work and it reads worse. On top of that, this actually confuses the type system. Are we dealing with list of ints or list of ints or none? Now, if you want to turn this into more truly functional code, you could use the maybe monad from the returns package or do railroad oriented programming with a result type, which requires another dependency and so not very Pythonic. So honestly, that wouldn't be my preferred choice. The third case I want to cover is side effects, such as writing to file or doing some logging. Using map or filter when you're not actually returning anything meaningful, just performing side effects, breaks the whole idea of functional purity. Here I have an example that uses a for loop, which is a loop that's used to write warnings to a file. As you can see, this gets a list of log entries, and then for each entry it's going to get the timestamped message. And then if it finds a warning, then it's going to print that warning. Seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do as part of a logging system. And in my main function, I have a list of log entries and then I'm passing that to the write warnings function. When I run this, then this is what we get as a result. There's a single warning in this code. And you can also see it right here. If you want to replace this for loop with map and filter, well, then you will probably get something like this. So I still have the write warnings function, but inside that I define a process function that takes that does the work for a single entry. And then I map that function to the list of log entries. And within that process function, I then create the timestamped message. I open the warnings text file and then write the message. And if there is a warning there, then I'm going to print it. Now this looks clever until you realize that this is actually reopening the file for every single entry. Also, in order to actually perform the operation, you need to turn the result of map into a list because map returns an iterator. So we're creating a list just to force evaluation. That's a code smell. You could of course partly solve this by moving out this context manager to the top level and define a process function inside that. But it's still not pretty because there is all this print side effects and we still have to turn it into a list to actually work. In short, don't use map for side effects because that's a functional anti-pattern. The final case I want to show you is when you have early exits with break or continue. Here I have another example where there's a function that scans a list of events for suspicious logins. And it calls a, another function is suspicious on a particular event. And that just checks that there is an unusual keyword being used in the details. And then what it does is that it goes through this list of events. If it's suspicious, then it's going to print something and then it's going to break because then you want to take action. You don't want to process the rest of the events. Let me run this just to show you what it does. In this case, it stops because there was a suspicious login that was detected. How would you actually implement this in a more functional way? So you would try to be clever maybe by using filter. So we could take events and filter it on suspicious events. And in this case, what we're doing is that we're calling next so that the iterator is actually being called. So what this does is that this is going to give us the first suspicious entry. And then if that event exists, then we are simply going to print it. So this works but it also loses the clear step-by-step -step logic that the loop had. Also, this doesn't support continue, skipping entries, or logging why something was skipped. In short, if your logic is simple and pure, map and filter can make it concise and efficient. If you need lazy evaluation that fits well within your design, then map and filter are also great choices. But when the logic becomes complex, you need to deal with exceptions. There are side effects like printing things or you require fine control like exiting early. Then the humble for loop is actually a great option. Coding is not about being clever. It's about using the simplest, most readable solution to a problem. And to drive that point home, I just want to show you something really interesting. So here I have the Iron Codes workspace, which is where I have most of my repositories related to my YouTube channel. So in particular, there's the examples repository that contains all the code examples of basically any video that I ever made on the channel. And 
What's interesting is if you look for when I'm using the for loop, well, we're going to get like lots and lots of results. Now there is some uh, false positives like uh, using for in a readme file and things like that. But as you can see, there's actually quite a lot of for loop usage in my code examples. Now, if I look for map, cost to map, I see that there is only 90 results and filter there's only 44. So as you can see, I'm using for loops way, way more than map and filter. And that's for good reason. I use the for loop so often because in most cases, I just find it easier to read and easier to work with. But maybe that's just my own limitation. I don't know, what, what do you think? Do you prefer using map and filter over for loops in your own code? Or do you stick to list comprehensions and classic loops? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Now I mentioned the maybe monad and the returns package. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't use that, but learning about those concepts, learning about monads is actually really helpful. It's a good thing to know about as a developer, especially if you want to learn other programming languages in the future like Rust. I did a full video about this package a while back. You can check it out right here. Thanks for watching and see you next time.